again. Uh, and today we're going to go over topic 2.3, exchange in the Indian Ocean, which is pretty cleanly broken into two parts, uh, one being the cause of expanded of, of how cha uh, trade expanded in the Indian Ocean and the effects of that expanse. So again, what we're looking at here is the years 1200 to 1415 CE. Um, so we've seen Indian Ocean trade for a while. Um, especially uh, starting in 600 or so um, with the rise of Islam. Uh, and so that's, in fact, our first cause of expanded exchange uh, in this era. Uh, it continues to expand, uh, especially as Islam itself continues to spread into new territories during this time period. Um, and so um, it's not just the spread of Islam per se, but it's the spread of Islam around the Indian Ocean Basin, right? That's kind of the key component here is that as these Muslim merchants have traded for, you know, almost half a millennia in the Indian Ocean, they've started to bring their culture with them into a lot of different places. And some of those places include uh, East Africa. Um, we see a lot of Muslim communities there. Uh, we see uh, some Muslim communities in East Asia and Southeast Asia, especially, right? Uh, and then, of course, in South Asia, in India, we also see the growth of Muslim communities, right? So all these Muslim communities, you know, creates a sense of cultural continuity and, and cultural familiarity that allows for merchants to trade more with these places um, that they know. Um and a, and a town in particular in India that they wanted to pick out here is the town of Calicut. Uh, this will become a very important trade center um, for especially for uh, Arab merchants. This is kind of a midpoint between um, the Arabian merchants and the Chinese merchants in the west and the east. Right. Um, so that was a that was a big reason for the growth of trade there. The second part uh, is the increased demand for certain products, right? Increased demand for not necessarily luxuries, but definitely the specialized products that the uh, that many of the Indian Ocean communities are known for having, right? Um, so uh, each region kind of had something to offer. Uh, that was kind of its specialty. So India uh, really specializes in cotton textiles, right? Cotton products, right? Um, that made them quite a lot of money, quite wealthy during the time period. Um, Southeast Asia, uh, especially Indonesia, right? Uh, is very well known for its spices. Uh, let's actually call this the Southeast Asian. Uh, um, instead of calling it Southeast Asia, yeah, let's just go ahead and, and say it is Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, especially Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia itself will become known as the Spice Islands, right? Uh, very well known for its spices, uh, nutmeg, uh, cinnamon, clove, uh, and cardamom, right? It's kind of their big ones. Okay. Um, from the Swahili coast in Africa, uh, what we see... Uh, and traded quite a bit as kind of our three go-to goods out of Africa, uh, ivory, uh, gold, and slaves. Okay. Um, and then um, in ch from China, of course, uh, kind of our two major goods we talked about out of China, uh, silk and porcelain, right, being the two major goods to come out of China. Um, and then finally, um, out of Southwest Asia, right, kind of the Middle East, right? Uh, Middle East and Persia. Uh, they're not necessarily as luxurious with their goods, right? They're not, they're not as luxury goods as, as China and Swahili coast and Southeast Asia are bringing to the table. Uh, it is horses and figs and dates, which, hey, dates are delicious. So that's quite all right. All right. So um, those are the big trade goods that come out of that each of these different areas. Um, and in fact, they kind of have a section here where they talk about the the slave trade. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I don't think there, there's a whole lot necessarily uh, that we haven't talked about before, right? Um, but we do see the spread of African customs as African slaves are traded in this network. Um, they also talk about environmental knowledge. Uh, but when we talk about environmental knowledge of the Indian Ocean, it really only comes down to one thing, and that, of course, is the monsoon winds. So the monsoons were these um, seasonal storms, right? Seasonal hurricanes that would create lots of different wind patterns. 
Um, and so in the winter, they would go from the northeast, right, into the southwest. And then in the spring and summer, they, they would blow in the opposite direction. So if, if uh, merchants were able to time their voyages uh, properly, they would be able to use these to get around a lot quicker, right? Um, our fourth cause uh, is advances in uh, maritime technology. Right? And again, we've talked about a lot of these already, uh, but hey, might as well go over them again, right? Um, so uh, first off, we have the Latine sails, also known as triangular sails, right? Uh, which allowed for a lot more maneuverability on the winds, right? Um, we also have the stern rudder, uh, stern post rudder, uh, that was invented by Chinese sailors uh, in the post-classical period. Um, and then these two, uh, these two uh, techniques, or excuse me, these two technologies were combined for the kind of most famed merchant ship of the post-classical era in the Indian Ocean, which is the Dows uh, of Arab and Indian merchants. These very small ships um, that didn't necessarily carry a whole lot, but they're very maneuverable, they're very quick, uh, which really helped uh, get trade going. And of course, as trade increased, we see the increased usage of these technologies throughout the Indian Ocean. Um, uh, and then lastly, um, the astrolabe they talked about, right? Um, so the astrolabe was uh, invented, I believe, in Greece, but Muslim navigators uh, improved it during the 12th century and helped spread it around. Um, and they didn't talk about this for some reason. I'm going to bring it up, though. It's got to be the compass, right? The compass is a huge technological innovation, right, that helps grow trade. Um, last, I don't know, is this last? I shouldn't say last. I should, yes, this is lastly. Uh, lastly and not leastly uh, is the growth of large states um, within the Indian Ocean Basin. So um, we've talked about this when it comes to the Silk Road already, but when you have large states, they tend to want to protect trade a lot more, which makes trade a lot more safe uh, than usual from pirates or bandits or, or whatever. Um, and one thing I particularly wanted to point out, which um, I kind of thought they would talk about this earlier, but I'm glad they're bringing it up, uh, is the state of Malacca. Okay, um, the state of Malacca um, it became very strong uh, via taxing and protecting uh, trade um, by a, with building a strong navy to protect trade and then also taxing trade uh, through the Strait of Malacca. Right, which is in Southeast Asia, which basically, um, uh, you know, it, it uh, controlled trade from the South China Sea uh, into the Indian Ocean, right? So um, they became very, very powerful by controlling that um, and taxing it. Um, and so um, this kind of comes to an end with the Portuguese invade, right? Um, and they kind of, they, they had a little discussion about Portugal, but I'm not going to get too much into that right now. Um, the effects of Indian Ocean exchange. Okay, so our first major effect is the uh, growth of what are called di diasporic, diasporic? diasporic, uh, diasporic communities. Okay, so if you haven't hit this word before, uh, this word tends to be associated with the Jewish diasporas, um, the first one coming during the um, uh, the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem, uh, way, way long ago, uh, the second one coming during the Roman conquest of Jerusalem, uh, in the, I want to say the 100s BCE, first century BCE, maybe, right? Um, and so when we see this happen, um, we start, so, so, so what happens here? So what we see is that merchants uh, tend to, um, instead of necessarily uh, moving around, um, you know, or, or maybe staying in, a, living in an area that's not necessarily central to the Indian Ocean trade, right? We start to see, um, uh, merchants from from Arabia, right, and East Africa, instead of staying where they're from, uh, they start to migrate into uh, the center of the uh, Indian Ocean trade, uh, which is the southern Indian port cities. All right, so we see the move here to be central to trade to help control their trade routes, right, and their businesses and stuff like that, right. Um, and they would marry women uh, from these West Indian port cities, right? Um, we also see um, Arab and Persian merchants moving to East Africa, 
Um, again, as well, they're not necessarily as central, uh, but East Africa is more important than um, the Arab areas and Persia uh, in terms of this kind of ma major trade network, right? Um, and so what we're seeing here is that um, these groups, of course, right, these Arab and Persian merchants, right, are, are going to bring Islam with them uh, into these new areas, right? They bring Islam with them, uh, of course, because they, you know, they practice it, right? Um, and then instead of uh, converting people through conquest or through missionaries, uh, they convert people via marrying into these local communities, right? And help spreading it kind of more naturally, right, than, than what conquest would do, right? Um, and so these communities are what we would call diasporas, right? These settlements of, of people away from their home, right? So that is what a diaspora is, right? Is the, is the settlement of settling of people away from their homeland. Now, um, sometimes we kind of talk about it as more of a large scale thing, um, uh, uh, you know, with the Jewish diaspora, right? It's almost like the entire community has to move away, right? And this isn't necessarily the entire community, right? But we are seeing large sectors or large sections of Arab, Muslim, Persian, Muslim society move away from their homeland into these new areas, right? Um, and they introduce their own cultures uh, and are in turn in introduced to the cultures of these other areas, right? And so they kind of point out a, a few different um, uh, diasporic communities, maybe not even just during this uh, uh, era, but other eras as well. Of course, we're talking about the Muslim diaspora here. Uh, there's also a Chinese diaspora into places like Southeast Asia and Africa. Uh, Sogdian, um, which is the kind of Samarkand merchants, right? Samarkand people, uh, they move along the Silk Roads. Um, the Jewish diaspora, of course, we have talked about. Uh, they will make their way into places like China, India, and, of course, Europe. Uh, and then Malay merchants will make their ways into places like Sri Lanka and Madagascar. Okay. So, um, a second effect of this um, is um, what the section calls a response to increased demand, right? Um, and so these responses lead to more change, right? All right, responses to increased demand. Okay, so. Um, what happens here, um, we start to see um, new ways people try to become more efficient, right? right? We see um, this increase in demand uh, leads to attempts to find uh, more efficiency, leads to um, more efficiency, right, within the production systems, right? Now, we're not saying factories or anything, right? Factories aren't happening yet, right? But we are seeing, you know, maybe more manufacturers, maybe we're seeing larger plantations, right, and stuff like that. Um, and so um, the other thing that happens here is as there's more money caught up in Indian Ocean trade, right, we see the role of state increased as well, right? The, the states of the, of the region of the Indian Ocean Basin um, all of a sudden need to make sure they protect this trade more uh, and to make it more efficient, right? Um, whether it's, um, you know, protection, right, whether it's, uh, levying tariffs, right, uh, uh, taxes on trade, right, whether it is, um, um, you know, uh, efficiency, right, of these businesses, right, through government regulations, right, and stuff like that. Um, and one state they in particular they talked about is the uh, Western Indian uh, Rajput Kingdom of Gujarat. Uh, Gujarat is kind of the middle, the main middleman state in India um, that will eventually become incredibly wealthy during this time period, right? Um, the third uh, is the growth of the Swahili city-states as kind of serious, um, a serious set of societies that are very powerful um, and very wealthy, right? Um, so first off, Swahili, of course, is a is a mixture is an is an Arabic term that means coasters. Um, but Swahili itself is a language that is a blend of Bantu and Arabic, which is kind of showing again the the diasporic influence on this society, right? 
Um, and uh, so they would, in particular, trade the gold, the, the goods we talked about, right? Gold, ivory, and slaves uh, into the uh, Indian Ocean Trade Network, right? Um, they talked a little bit about uh, some of the more exotic goods. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, and so what we see here is that trade brings quite significant wealth to this area for the first time, right? This is kind of the growth of this society, um, right? And that's kind of what they're bringing up here is that we're seeing like a new society kind of grow up here uh, on the Swahili coast, right? Um, and so um, they even talked about the, um, uh, the one of the big examples uh, is the construction of stone or coral mosques on the coast. Right, which kind of displayed the wealth instead of it being the kind of traditional architecture of the area, which was mud and clay. Right. Okay. Um, and then the last thing here, uh, the fourth and final kind of major effect, is uh, cultural exchanges. And you really can't have a discussion about Indian Ocean trade in the era um, without talking about one man. And that one man, of course, is the uh, the uh, Muslim Chinese general, Chinese admiral, excuse me, uh, Zheng He. Okay, so Zheng He is a is um, sent out by Emperor Yang Yangle or Yangle um, to uh, kind of recon reconnoiter to recon um, the Indian Ocean basin, but also to kind of um, create relations with the Indian Ocean merchants and, and states, right? Um, he went on seven massive voyages throughout the Indian Ocean, um, throughout the Indian Ocean network. Um, and the main reason, right, is to display the might of the Ming by showing off uh, their massive ships uh, and then also the wealth and treasures that they had, right? Um, they talk about how he had 300 ships with 28,000 people on them at its height, right? Um, and he comes back, uh, 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 so first off, does this work? Yes, it does, right? We see an increase in prestige for the Ming dynasty, right? Um, and then we also see new markets opened up to China, right? They talk about how uh, the first draft ever is brought to China from, by Zheng He. Um, and then also um, we start to see uh, merchants kind of immigrate outside of China. Um, the big issue, though, is that the uh, con is the Confucian lifestyle, right? The Confucians are quite unhappy with this, right? So the Confucian philosophy, right, does not necessarily talk about foreign trade as like a big deal, right? They talk about how um, they focus on a agrarian lifestyle, right, a farming lifestyle that is very stable, right, and um, uh, and having foreign trade, having foreign influence can tend to create um, more instability, right? Can, you know, the, the bringing in of new ideas can make people question the current system that they're in, right? Um, and so we also saw uh, some other reasons were kind of looking down on other cultures, right? China, again, as the middle kingdom, right? This kind of elevated culture um, makes them not necessarily as welcoming to other cultures and other ideas, right? And then for some uh, Confucians, it's simply too expensive, especially because they were facing some uh, border issues uh, to the north, right? Um, and so Yongle's successor ends the, uh, ends, the, um, ends the voyages, right? Um, so Yongle's successor ends the voyages, Right. Um, and also kind of discourages almost entire discourages having a Navy at all for China, which is going to be a huge issue going forward. Right. Um, and in fact, he, he they talk about how you can't build big, big ships anymore. It's not with a fence in, the, in China at this point. Um, but one of the uh, there is a sh he you know, short term result here. He, he ends piracy on the Chinese coast. Uh, because of his ships, not uh, we're talking about Jiangha right here um, on the on the coast and in Southeast Asia. Uh, just to kind of make sure I'm talking about Jiangha, I'm not talking about Yongle's successor, right? 
Um, and but then they will resume a course as soon as they end their navy, right? So this is just an example of one of those cultural exchanges, though, right? We're, it's pretty clear we have this cultural exchanges with the dias diaspora communities, uh, these like unity city states, right? And then Zhenghe kind of representing another cultural exchange, right? And then of course Zhenghe also introduces kind of one of the greater what ifs of, of history, right? If you think about these this kind of setup here, right? These massive ships that he has. Um, you know, what happens if he uh, or the Chinese government, instead of kind of backing away from expansion, um, what if they instead decided to um, go, you know, to uh, go east, right? Go towards the Americas, right? What would they have found? Maybe they would have colonized it. Maybe they would have created a Chinese state in the Americas. Um, Zheng He's voyages are about 50 years, 60 years before the first um the first touchdown of Christopher Columbus in the new world, right? So maybe they get there ahead of them and then create a, a an entirely new world. Um, it's a fascinating thing to think about. Um, but unfortunately, that is that did not happen. And that is where I have to leave you for today. Uh, I will see you.